You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications button so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. I had a difficult upbringing, a very, very difficult upbringing. My dad was a, a raging alcoholic, he would drink three or four bottles of wine a night, didn't work, um, was quite a violent man. So the business that I started off the back of reading his book three years later, that same billionaire bought 50% of the company for a quarter of a million pound. So from 22, one man in Havana started. Fast forward to 29 years of age, I was running the largest independent boiler installation company in the UK, doing a million in sales a month. We had 100 employees. We operated in every major city in the UK. It was a um, crazy, crazy journey. And I took major sacrifices. I had a girlfriend for four years. Within eight weeks, she was gone. Yeah, gone. Because she just was like, fuck this. You're never here anymore. And I was like, look, I ain't going to be around. This is how it's going to be now from here on in. Not a year, not two years. This is how it's going to be. This is my life now. I'm building an empire. You'll never see me. I want to build an empire and it comes with sacrifice. It comes with sacrifice on physical health, mental health, relationships, everything, right? Um, but how bad do you want it is the question. You know, you look at Elon Musk and what he's achieved. That guy sleeping on the floor doing 22 hours a day in these factories. We won National Installer of the Year in 2019, September, and then um, by December, we were in bad trouble. And I was like, fuck, man, I'm gonna lose this business. I'm gonna, I'm gonna go into the press. I'm gonna be the first apprentice to have failed. It was horrible. It was horrible what I was going through. Ben Moran. And today's guest has got the apprentice winner, Joe Valente. Thanks How for having you, me, Joe? champ. Good to see you. Excellent. Looking very colourful today, my man. <laughs> Looking good. I know. I thought I'd come down and make an impact. It's great outside, isn't it? So I wanted to yeah. bring you some sun. Good man. But won the apprentice 2015. Yep. But our roller coaster life, like, mm -hmm. took, took your business. I think you were the first apprentice to buy your business back off of Lord Sugar. Is that correct? That's right. Yeah. Yeah. So um, I was in business with him for two years, two and a half years. And, um, you know, it's an amazing experience. You know, really, really blessed to have um, been given the opportunity. But after like two and a half years, I kind of found that there was only so far that I was going to go being Lord Sugar's business partner. Yeah, there are a lot of restrictions in place. Things you're allowed to do, things you're allowed to say, activity you're allowed to do on social media, other business ventures. So I decided to, um, I decided to speak to him and just say, look, you know, um, do you want me to go this far on in the podcast yeah, straight away? Yeah, now? just yeah? do bits and bobs, then we'll go back to the yeah, start. Yeah, okay, anyway. cool. So, um, yeah, so I decided after two and a half years that you know there were restrictions in place. Everybody was saying to me, "Your Lord Sugar's business partner." I was like, "No, I'm Joseph Valente. I wanted to be known as my own brand." And um, they'd helped me quite a bit in the business, but actually, I found that they were limiting me. You know, I wanted to become a national plumbing and heating business, and Lord Sugar wanted me to make a bit of profit, tick along in the background, come out every every year on the You're Hired show. And so we could say, look at my apprentice winners, they're making some money. And, you know, I quit my job and started a business in um, 2012 at 22 years of age because I read Lord Sugar's book. And he inspired me because he was a guy that had built a billion dollar empire. And I was never going to build a billion dollar empire, James, by being in his shadow, you know, and I wanted to go big. And I genuinely believe that he was afraid of that risk by growing too quickly. So I said to him one day, listen, if you don't want to um, take the risk on, let me buy you out. I'll go it alone. And um, if it fails, it's all on my shoulders. A lot of pressure, bro. <laughs> I always go back to the start of my guests, mm -hmm. where you grew up and how it all began. Okay, so I grew up in a city called Peterborough, a working class family. Um, I had a difficult upbringing, a very, very difficult upbringing. My dad was a, a raging alcoholic, he would drink three or four bottles of wine a night, didn't work, um, was quite a violent man. Um, and my mum works three jobs to keep our family alive, to um, keep food on the table. She did cleaning, she did dinner lady, all these low paying jobs that she could kind of squeeze in between running the family as well. And, um, you know, we really, really struggled. We didn't have go on holidays, didn't go on school trips, didn't have new stuff. And I remember thinking very early on, kind of from like four or five years of age, that this isn't what life is all about. 
You know, why are we struggling? Why is there other people out there that can have whatever they want? And yet we seem to always be under so much pressure, so much stress. And I made a decision very, very early on, very early on that I was never, ever going to live my life in the way that I was growing up, ever. And I had an uncle who was very, very wealthy very wealthy. He'd um, built an incredible career, started from the bottom, um, had built his way up through corporate. And I used to see him twice a year. Big tall guy, six foot three, full head of hair, would walk into a room in an amazing suit, strong, confident, wherever we, wherever we went, everybody would respect him. And um, he would come down in a brand new car, you know, we would have some banged out A-Reg, Sierra or Fiesta or whatever car we could afford at the time. And I remember looking at my dad and then I'd look at my uncle and my uncle was my mum's brother and my dad was um, from Italy. And I'd look at the two guys and I'd say, how does one man have this existence? And how does one man have this existence? And why are they different? What is it about these two men that he's gone so far wrong and he's done so fantastically well? And so I decided to mimic my uncle. I didn't want to become like my dad. I was embarrassed of my dad. Um, I kind of hated my dad, but I wanted to become my uncle. And so I think I was very blessed in the fact that I saw somebody that was close to me that had broke the system, yeah, and that had been able to achieve success. So I believed it was possible for me. How were you at school? Did uh, you have that mindset at school, though, seeing things differently? Were you a lot of people who can be daydreamers? Yeah. Where school doesn't fit in with, like you say, it's a system, but is to break away from that system and be conditioned mm -hmm. from a very young age to just go by society's rules and regulations where if you're a young kid and seeing that, weighing up between your uncle mm -hmm. and your dad and going, but why is your dad doing that? Like, so how were you at school? Did you see things differently mm -hmm. as a kid? Were you a loner? Um, I was a really good student up until probably year four or year five. How so? As soon as I hit like 10 years of age, started to get cocky started to get confident, wanted to break all of the rules, um, started to answer my dad back. I was afraid of him when I was young. Yeah, and then I started to answer him back, started to push him. We'd get a slap, get a beating. And um, I wanted to just keep pushing that. I was like, screw this, right? I don't want to be told what to do. I don't want to come here. I don't like half of these lessons. Actually, I don't like 80% of these lessons. I'm bored here, like you said, daydreaming, wanting to do the things that I wanted to do. I always had a very strong mind, always been very, very strong-willed. So my dad left at 13. And um, as soon as he left, that was it, gloves are off. I became an absolute delinquent. You know, I was out till three, four in the morning. My mum couldn't control me. I was doing whatever I wanted. I was hanging around with 16, 18, 20 year olds as a 13, 14 year old. Um, and my life wasn't going anywhere fast. I was getting in a lot of trouble. I was getting arrested all the time. Um, things were not looking good for me. Um, I was skiving in school pretty much every day. I was doing whatever I could to not go there. Um, you know, and um, I was doing any, I was doing anything I could to be excluded. And then when the kind of 14 and a half hit, um, nearly 15, they expelled me. And it was kind of the worst and best thing that ever happened to me. Why? Because I walked out of the, um, because if you tell me um, that I can't do something, then I will prove to you that I can do it. And, and I had a mindset at the time where they, everybody said that I was bad. Everybody said that, you know, I was gonna end up in prison. Everybody said that, you know, my life was going nowhere. And I remember thinking, right, okay, you think I'm a bad child? Watch how bad I can be. You know, if you're gonna label me that, I'm gonna show you. And then I came, I, was, I came out of the headmaster's office, my mum was crying and I love my mum to bits. She's an incredible woman. And I remember it really hurt me. And I was looking at her and she just looked so fed up, so disappointed. And she just looked at me and she said, what are you going to do now? What are you actually going to do? You're finished. Yeah. And she wrote me off at 15 and said I was finished because I'd been expelled from this system where I didn't believe I was actually getting any value anyway. Why are you telling me that to go to an art lesson when I can't draw? I'm never going to get good at drawing. So I don't see the point of coming here once a week and being told I'm no good at it. Right. So I couldn't see the value in it anyway. And I remember looking back at her and saying to her, don't worry, mum, I'm going to make it. Yeah. And then at that moment, James, I realized that 
Um, up until this point, I blamed everybody for why everything was going wrong in my life. My dad, my mom, my stepdad, schools, teachers, everything was everybody else's fault. And I said, I'm sick and tired of your excuses. I said that to myself, I'm sick and tired of your excuses. Um, everybody has left you now. You've got nobody left to go to. You're on your own and the cavalry isn't coming, my friend. Okay, there's no one coming to save you and no one gives a shit about what you've got to say anymore so it was like right i'm on my own now so what am i going to do about it if i carry on going this way right it's going to be game over for me or if i take that same passion that same energy that same enthusiasm that i have for all these bad things i was creating in my life and put that into something good then wow i can become somebody incredible and so i chose that day to stop going to the park every single day hanging around with these kids doing things that i shouldn't be doing and i decided to go to work how hard was it for your mum, like, obviously losing her husband as well, alcoholic, mm -hmm. and then seeing her son being expelled? Like, she must have worried at that time that you could have potentially chose the same path as your dad at yeah. a very young age. Like, how hard is that for a woman that I know how much you care about? Obviously, we'll touch mm -hmm. on later in the interview, but you would do anything for her, but also adding that pressure onto her life of pain, basically. Mm -hmm. You know what? Up until probably uh, um, very recently, you know, and I spent, my dad passed away about four weeks ago. Sorry to hear that. And, uh, it's okay. And, um, you know, and I didn't really realize up until, because I'm 32 now, nearly 33, and I didn't actually realize probably what his, what the real reasons for his um alcoholism was i didn't understand mental health i didn't know probably what was going on you know you're a kid you don't really understand these things and so for me i didn't I, at that time i didn't care my dad left and our our home growing up to 13 was hell on a daily basis it was a horrible place to be and um, then my mum went and found a new partner and within six months she was with a new man and you know and, and, and she wasn't jumping around men she's not that type of woman at all but she had to you know look after her family she's probably worried about finances she'd met this new guy she had such a terrible time but then I became an outcast in the family I didn't want to go home there was this new guy in my house and I just hated everyone I was so angry so pissed off and i probably didn't care now i look back and i think you know i was not a good person but i was in a very angry young teenager that was pissed off with the world and had a chip on his shoulder um and now i do really understand and i think um i'm forever trying to make amends with my mum um and try and give her a nice life now um for all of the bad stuff that i probably put her through and what she had to deal with as we were growing up yeah that's all you can do now it is so you decided to make a change not hang about with the bad boys not be drinking in mm -hmm. the park that what was the next steps for you then to progress in life? So there was this really cool guy. His name was Darren Boardman. He was 25 years of age, good looking, always had um, in the local area, the best girl. He had a BMW and he was a plumber, right? And um, he just started his own business. And I was, um, he had quite a reputation locally and I was um, best friends with his cousin. And I was like, right, I'm going to go and ask him if I can come and work with him. I, I actually got sent to like a school for delinquents after I was expelled from like normal school. And it was like the craziest thing, right? Let's put every single um, nutcase in the city in one place, right? Because that's where they should all go, right? Let's put them all together. Um, and then that's going to work really well. So I went to this other school, this unit called Leap, and it it was just chaos you know every every terrible kid just doing whatever they wanted i was like this is just not for me it was out of control it wasn't getting anywhere it was worse than school um and so i decided to just quit and i quit and literally no one contacted me i just stopped going i went there for about two months and stopped going approached darren and i said look i should be in school I'm, i don't want to go back can i come and work for you for free for a year teach me everything you know about plumbing when i turned 16 start paying me and put me into college. He just started his business, so he didn't have a lot of money. So, um, you know, having a free work was great for him and um, having a, an apprentice. And then for me, it was amazing. So I got to hang around with him because he was a cool dude and I wanted to be like him anyway. And I also got to learn a trade. And that was such a pivotal moment for me. I went to work every single day. I was there on time. You know, I did everything I was told to do, never answered back, never any problems. Um, and you know, that changed my life that very moment. And that's what set me on this career to um, doing what I do now in construction. Why do you think you, you held a job, like going on time and actually listening, but you never done that at school? Because it's what I wanted to do. It's what I wanted to do. 
you know it was it was simply because it was what i wanted to do it's kind of my way or the highway you know and i wanted to be there right you know and and school you're forced to go i always find if anybody forces me to try and do anything it kind of makes me get claustrophobic right and i have to just um lash out or you know leave or whatever it may be whereas this it was my choice no one was making me you felt suffocated if somebody yeah. was putting pressure on you always i do yeah so you when did you get into the boiler stuff so fast forward two years 18 qualified plumber 19 qualified gas engineer at that point i was making 50 grand a year at 19 i'd done really well making double the teachers were making and you know everybody had wrote me off and so you know my career had moved on quite quickly yeah and then hit 21 and i was doing well again still making 50k servicing boilers every day and i was like what am i doing with my life here right just doing this every single day i felt like i've already hit the ceiling and as far as i could go so i was like this can't just be it i'd grown up in peterborough i'd lived in peterborough for 21 years and i said right i'm going to australia so i sold up sold everything that i had quit my job um, and moved over to australia for six months what did you do there partied yeah. <laughs> traveled um worked um experience life yeah it was the most amazing experience and anyone listening to this podcast this like you know in in their late teens or early 20s or even mid 20s right get out to australia go and experience it you know there's plenty to do when you get home you can build your career when you get home but you only get you know that one shot at that youth and that freedom and that experience where nothing matters other than you know kind of where you're going to go and party the next night or what you're going to go and do the next day. So it was incredible. Do you think there's a lot of pressure on kids now working in 95 and just staying at that desk for the rest of their life? Like, but people don't experience life. People go to Ibiza and go for five days or they'll go mm -hmm. to Crete or Cavos or whatever it is they'll go and they'll think they're living the high life. But like you say, traveling the world, experience different mm -hmm. people experiencing like just different scenarios and, and learning from yourself. Like that life experience, you can't be taught that in college, school, universities. Yeah. Like just understanding people and having communication skills and, and being bold enough to, to do things alone is where I believe your growth is. That's where you'll find out who you truly are as a person when you're alone and try to figure it out. When you're surrounded yeah. by too many people, too many opinions, too many thoughts, it can drown you out your own noise mm -hmm. and you follow other people's paths. Like how hard do you think it is for kids now to see the world a bit differently yeah because there's so much conditioning from even their phones i'm addicted to my phone like, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. the shit that you're watching it's just recommended to you and you actually start watching it and then before you know it the brain's like a sponge mm -hmm. it absorbs Definitely. everything like, yeah. do you think it's tough for kids now to mm -hmm. make choices to try and stay free i think everybody's too safe now um they're too safe you know i left home when i was 17 and um that forced me to learn the world very, very quickly. My mum threw me out. I wasn't good at 17. Um, and um, so I left home at 17. And um, granted, it wasn't the best scenario. And I don't want that for everybody listening to this. So that's the way to do it. But the younger that you can leave home, the faster that you can become independent. People staying at home to the 25, 28, 30, you're around your family, you're around your parents, your mum's still going to be doing everything for you. Um, and so it's too safe. And I don't think people um, want to get out of their comfort zone enough. You know, and I do believe, again, the school system, there's so much pressure, GCSEs, A-levels, go to university. When is the time to stop? There isn't really, people have gap years. But the problem is, with a gap year, is... You feel like, I feel like you're losing time when they're trying to build their careers. You know, they feel like they've got to do it so quickly. There's so much pressure to get those degrees um, at an early age. And I think that, you know, people need to get out there and they need to go and see the world 100%. Because I was, I'd, I'd, I'd done my, I went at 21. So I'd done my kind of, my version of university, which was going to plumbing college and going to gas college, MVQ level three. I'd done like two and a half years of education. And then I realized that, you know, 
I, if I want to service boilers for the next 40 years, I can at least lose a year and come back and do the thing. You know, I've got the qualification now. And quite luck, quite luckily, I had a high paying job. So I knew that I could go to Australia, come straight back and get a job. And I do believe that, you know, that's probably um, a comfort blanket that I had knowing that I could come back and get paid straight away. Kids that leave for uni that are already in a lot of debt that leave uni and struggle to get a job, they're probably looking at it and going, well, what am I going to do when I get back? You know, how am I going to walk straight back into a job? So finance is a big factor for sure. So if you're making 50 grand a year, mm -hmm. everything going well, that like, we're not scared to, to take that break in case, because it is hard to pull back because we can get lazy, we can get complacent mm -hmm. where you take the foot off the gas, sometimes it fizzles out, mm -hmm. but we're not scared of coming back and losing that what you had built. No, because I knew that I could rebuild it. And I don't know whether psychologically um, I'd had this um, thing imprinted in me that was you can get a trade for life. A trade is for life, they used to say in the town that I grew up. You get that skill, you'll never be out of a job. You know, it was never go and build a business. No one was I was around was like, go and be a multimillionaire, go and be a billionaire, you can build an empire. It was have a job for life. I don't want a fucking job for life, right? Um, I want to be a billionaire. So, um, so um so no i wasn't worried because the skill was there and it was high in demand so i knew i could easily walk back and and um do it and also again you know i i always I get bored very, very quickly. And if I'm not creating the next thing, if there isn't something exciting in my life, major depression kicks in very, very fast. I'm like, I've got to be fed with um, something exciting all of the time, or, you know, um, it ends up becoming destructive for me. And your mind can slip. Yeah. So when you come back, what was the steps then to then build a multi million pound business? So I came back, um, got straight back into the same job. Literally, the, the, the company took me straight back, got a house. And um, I was like, wow, within a week, I was literally just like, I'd seen my friends I hadn't seen in a while, exciting for a couple of days. And it was like, shit, I'm back. Like, you know, I've just left an amazing country and here I am. And um, I was not happy at all. And I was thinking, man, you know, this can't be it again. And then my, and then this is where everything changed for me. Everything changed for me. So, excuse me. So my mum got me Lord Sugar's autobiography for Christmas. It was 2011, big thick book like that. What you see is what you get. And um, I read it over that period between Christmas and New Year. Yeah, yeah, and I was employed, so I had like two or three weeks off. Company used to shut down. And I remember I always used to tell everybody that I was going to win The Apprentice. I was an avid fan of The Apprentice. I watched it year in, year out. I used to vision those um, black cars pulling up and me getting out and me sat in the back of that Rolls Royce. You know, I used to get so excited when I'd hear um, the music come on and see all of the skyline and it going around the gherkin. It was just like, that was my vibe. I wanted to be in that moment, experience that. And so when she got me the book, I was like, well, look, I love Lord Sugar. I don't really know his story, but I'm a big Apprentice fan. I'm going to try it. First page in, I was addicted, addicted. And I hadn't read a book for like 20 years, you know, crazy since like year four, year five, um, year three, maybe. I don't know. I wasn't a big reader anyway. So I didn't read books. And um, I read this book and I was literally staying up till like three, four, five in the morning every night. I just couldn't put this book down. And I was just... Be, I would, this story was unfolding in front of me about how a guy came from a council estate in London with nothing and was able to build a billion dollar empire. And up until that point, I'd always justified other people's success by them being silver spooned or given an opportunity that I didn't have or they had a better family name or they were the rich and I'm the poor and you know we're different and it's good for them but it's not good for me we don't get those opportunities that hate that jealousy that we um, impart on other people's success because we don't have the same and it was a horrible mindset to have and it's not one that I have anymore um, but, you know, it was always a justified reason why somebody else had what they had and why we couldn't have it. It was always their fault, not ours, um, in my home and, and around the people that I was around. Um, 
and I was and I was made this excuse that they were on a pedestal. I put successful people on a pedestal. These people that had achieved incredible things, they weren't like me. They couldn't be like me. How could they be like me? They were sent by God, given the gifts of the gods. They were the special amongst us, right? And so anyway, I read this book and what I saw in this book was actually that this was just a man like me. He started with nothing. There was no um there was nothing godlike about this man. He was just another man and I'm another man. So if this man can do it, why can't I do it? And I saw how he built this empire. And then all of a sudden, bang, you know, my DNA changed. My mindset changed. It changed that much that um, I'd only been back from Australia for three months. At the end of the Christmas period, I was like, I'm done. I'm out of this employed game. Yeah, I'm going to start a business. So I went on Tesco's um, personal loans, uh, took out a 15,000 pound loan, quit my job, called my boss, said, look, I'm out. I'm starting a company. And um, that's when Impragas was born. How long did it take you to build that? So um, fast forward three years, I um, had uh, seven people working for me, doing half a million a year. That's when I applied for The Apprentice at 25. Um, and that's when Lord Sugar bought half of my company for 250 grand. So the business that I started off the back of reading his book, three years later, that same billionaire bought 50% of the company for a quarter of a million pound. Yeah. And then fast forward to 30 years of age. So from 22, one man in Havana started. Fast forward to 29 years of age, I was running the largest independent boiler installation company in the UK, doing a million in sales a month. We had 100 employees. We operated in every major city in the UK. It was a um, crazy, crazy journey. How does somebody drops out of school then run a multi-million pound business like that? What, what, what do you think it comes down to? because it's, you're clearly confident anyway mm, no matter if you lost it all again today mm, you would pick it back up within 12 months i believe that like, yeah do you think that ingredient is for someone who has dropped out of school like you say thinking everybody who's successful have mm -hmm. had the silver spoon but the majority of people who are successful mm -hmm. are come from fuck all yeah the ones with the silver spoon kind of destroy everything mm, that mm. maybe gets put in their way because they've already got it it's, yep there's got to be some sort of chase or buzzer to get up and go mentality. But who do you think that ingredient is for mm -hmm. someone to be successful? Great question. I mean, I just want to say a quote, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times. Um, uh, so I've got that wrong. Hang on. Strong men, uh, hard times create strong men, strong men create good times, good times create weak men. Yeah, so you're absolutely right. That generational wealth, you know, those people that get that wealth two or three um, generations down end up wasting it, right? Because they don't, it's not built with the same principles that that person in the family used to build that wealth from the start. So how did, how did I do it? Um, by not putting it on a pedestal. It's not actually as hard as what people think it is right? It really isn't. And as much as it was difficult, it wasn't that difficult. Now, I started the business as a plumber. Yeah, my business now trains businesses how to build a business. Yeah, because most people start a business, plumber starts a plumbing business, hairdresser starts a salon, accountant starts an accounting practice, lawyer starts a law firm. But they do that because they're fantastic at the job, James, right? They don't do it because they know anything about running a business. You can go and register a limited company for 20 pounds, become a director, a managing director, and the next day you've got an organization. This is why so many businesses fail, because people go in and just start companies without any idea of what it takes to run a company because they were a fantastic graphic designer. Now they think they can be a graphic design business owner, right? So I did it by being a plumber running a plumbing business. And um, the first thing that I did was just went for it, took that leap. It's like, well, if this fails, everybody's scared of protecting the little that they have. Well, what if this goes wrong? I could lose my house or I could lose this or I could lose that. Well, what about if you get to 70 and you've wasted your whole damn life living average? I'd say that's a lot more scary than just losing your house. Would you not agree? Yeah. yeah. So that motivation to just go for it is absolutely fundamental. You know, you are going to die. We are not getting out alive. So do not get to the end. Look back and think, I never even tried, you know? Um, that's point number one. 
Um, then number two um, is get perfect later. People want to put all of the um, all of the steps in place so they can see the roadmap. Starting a business, um, Elon Musk describes it like staring into the abyss and eating glass. Yeah, you're staring into the abyss. You can't see the roadmap in front of you. You don't know how this thing's going to go. Um, and so you've got to just have the confidence that the dots are going to connect moving forward, that you're going to be going down the right path. And it's difficult to know the first time that you've built a business, um, you know, what it's actually, what's, what it's going to look like. So I just went for it. Then I started making moves that were taking me on quantum leaps, not taking baby steps. I'm going quantum leaps. So I, in my mind, I had that I wouldn't employ somebody for like two years. Yeah, when, when I'm two years in, I'll employ someone. I ended up winning two contracts within the first week of being in business of 600 houses that exploded my company. I had to employ an apprentice within a week, a plumber within a month, an office within two months, an office staff within six months, five plumbers within a year. And so I'm taking these giant leaps um, to grow my organization, not waiting years and years and years to make small steps. So it's those quantum leaps. It's risking everything to get to the next level. I'm willing to put it all on the line. I'll put everything I own today on the line without any fear to get to the next level. You know, and I don't see fear. Um, I, I, I see, I make calculated risks now, not wild risks. I used to just risk everything blindly. Um, but you know, I'm here to make I'm here to make an impact, and you've got to make big, big steps to get there. So when you're taking those risks, do you mm -hmm. invest more money into the business. I take it then everything, money and time. You know, impra to get it from a one man in a van to a national company in seven years. I was when I tell you that I was spending a hundred hours a week in the first couple of years in that van. I didn't leave the van. I was going to work at six, five, six in the morning, getting home at two, three in the morning, sleeping for three hours on repeat. Seven Seven days a week. It was insanity work. Insanity work. You know, I remember laying in the bath in the morning, just like I can't, I can't even move my body. So but I was so um I was so motivated to get my mum into retirement. Like I started my company originally to put my mum into retirement. It was like the number one thing. I've got to treat her well, I've got to look after her, I've got to get, I've got to give her a good life before she dies. I don't want her to work till 75. By 55, she's got to be in retirement, so she's got time to spend the money, you know? And um, so that was my main motivation. And that drove me to insane levels. It was insane levels that I was prepared to go to to make that happen. And then, of course, applying for The Apprentice was like, I talk about quantum leaps just in the general moves that I was making. That um, propelled me into you know, another universe. It was just crazy, that platform and what it did for my organization. Yeah, because they say the hardest workers will be the successful, but if that was the case, then nurses and mm -hmm. tradesmen would be the richest people on the planet. Like you can you can work so hard, but still hit a plateau where you're not improving. Mm -hmm. But the risk for yourself, you believe, is investing more money into the business, mm -hmm. taking more risk, believing in yourself. Mm -hmm. How hard is it as well when you're working 100 hours a week, though, like, with a mindset? Like, mm -hmm. How do you find the balance? Is it just one way to burning yourself out to try yep. and create something special or do mm -hmm. you then take some time off and recharge mm -hmm. because recharging and mm -hmm. people can say like what 20 hours a day mm -hmm. up at 4am yep. I understand that mm -hmm. I, I do it myself sometimes we're on the road consistently to try and build a podcast and other businesses but sometimes it can be so fucking draining to your mental health like, and that's the most important thing in my eyes mm -hmm. but how do you then find the balance is it just straight away until you succeed and then you can take the foot off the gas or is it just non-stop Till yep. now. Well, I mean, I started at 22, so I was quite lucky that I had um, youth on my side. So I had a lot of energy. Got ADHD anyway, right? So I've got an abundance of energy to tap into. It's like an unlimited energy source, which is pretty <laughs> beneficial um, when you need to do that amount of work. Um, so I was young, right? And I took major sacrifices. I had a girlfriend for four years. Within eight weeks, she was gone. Yeah, gone. Cause she just was like, fuck this. You never hear anymore. And I was like, look, I ain't gonna be around. This is how it's gonna be now from here on in. Not a year, not two years. This is how it's going to be. This is my life now. I'm building an empire. You'll never see me, right? Um, and you're either with me or you're not. 
right? And so, you know, I was eating one microwave meal a day. I wasn't going to the gym. I didn't see anybody. I just worked non-stop. It was just insanity. I sacrificed my health. I sacrificed relationship. I sacrificed friendships. I sacrificed everything. But the business meant so much to me. Like it was all I cared about. I, it's all I. It's all I. It's all I could think about. I didn't think about anything else. I didn't want to do anything else. Now I used to be into, interested in football and sport. I didn't care about that anymore. Everything was gone. There was no other interest than running a company. It was really crazy. And now I'm 32, and I have a little boy. He's one month. He's one year and two weeks old now. Um, and um, I love him to bits, you know, but it haven't slowed down. You know, I'm definitely not getting in at two o'clock in the morning anymore, but I'm still back at nine o'clock. I'm leaving at six o'clock. Um, I'm out six days a week. I, I, I commit Sundays to spending the time with him to make sure I get the time with him and I get a little bit of time with him in the mornings each day. But I'm still here um, building an empire. I want to build an empire and it comes with sacrifice. It comes with sacrifice on physical health, mental health, relationships, everything, right? Um, but how bad do you want it is the question. You know, you look at Elon Musk and what he's achieved. That guy's sleeping on the floor doing 22 hours a day he's in these factories and he's just achieved in, insane things. So you've always got... Um, You've always got to ask yourself, how bad do you really want it and what are you prepared to do? Because work balance is absolutely key, but balance gets in the way of building the dream in my eyes. Um, and it's a really hard one because, you know, you do need to protect your mental health. And you have, I go to the gym every night now. I'm a lot more, um, I do a lot more for me than I did in my 20s now, in my 30s, 100%. And I enjoy it a lot more. But sometimes I still beat myself up and say, I'm not working anywhere near hard enough. I go and do a PT at seven o'clock for an hour. And I'm like, why am I still not in the office? I should be in the office right now. You're slacking. You're getting lazy. Why are you leaving this early, you know? <laughs> Do you think that helps though when you're exercising more? Do you, you think it gives you a better stability to see the vision better and clearer? But mm -hmm. if you're training and exercising and you're thinking I should be in the office, like... <laughs> But do you few benefits after exercise? Do you think <laughs> are you thinking you're losing an hour, an hour and a half exercise, then showering to then get to the office? Mm -hmm. Do you see the progress in that? Or do you or do you constantly think you should? Yeah, be doing no, more? I'm definitely seeing the progress in it. You know, I'd be lying if I said that uh, uh, this is now taken over me, the, more than me being in the office. I know I could be um, in the office for another hour, another two hours, another three hours, but to what end? You know, you only keep making money, and then you know, you just keep making more and more money. Um, so at the moment. I'm, I'm quite satisfied with the amount that I'm working and the amount I'm spending on myself because I don't want to just be a shell of a man, you know, not eating and being skinny and tired and just like, yeah, I've got loads of cash and my business is doing really well, but, you know, I'm just a shell of, shell of a human building this organization. I don't really want that again. And I do definitely believe there were parts of my 20s where I was like that, yeah. 100%. So you're turning over a mm. half a million a year. Mm. You've read Lord Sugar's book. Mm. You're, you're buzzing. Like you've, he's changed your life, mm. basically. Yeah. How did The Apprentice come about? So um, I'm a big believer in the law of attraction. I live my life by the law of attraction. I see everything in my mind before it happens. Everything I visualize everything. Um, uh, I believe I've got an ability to visualize stuff um, before it comes true. I usually see it and um, probably a year or so before it happens. And I'm getting even better at it now. I can do it much faster. I really do practice the law of attraction so much more. And I can affirm things into my life very, very quickly. But um, so... I'd, I'd plateaued, hit my ceiling, half a million a year. I was a plumber running a plumbing business. I had um, good money, nice car, nice house. Things were going well, but I was miserable. You know, I was just doing the same thing. I didn't, I didn't know what to do next. The, the skills as a businessman at half a million a year had capped out. And so I knew I needed mentorship. I needed somebody to show me the way to the next level. I couldn't do it on my own. And this is another big factor of how I did it, yeah, is that I got opened up to people that have been where I want to be. Yeah, I'm success leaves clues. Yeah, success leaves clues. If they've done it, how did they do it? And how can I get that? How can I use what they've done to fast track my success? Use their failures so I don't make the same mistakes because failing in business costs a lot of time, a lot of money, a lot of emotion, reputation. There's a lot that can come with failing at a big level. So if anybody listening to this um, is in business or wants to grow their business or wants to start a business, go and seek out those that have failed, right? And learn why they failed so you don't 
don't make the same mistake. Success is easy, yeah? Forget about the success bit, because that's easy. It's the failure that you want to fast track, because every failure that you overcome, the quicker that you get to success. Um, so I came into my home, it was nine o'clock, January the 9th, 2015. Lord Sugar's page came up, um, and it said, final chance to apply for The Apprentice. I knew at that very moment I'd won. Before I'd even applied, I knew I'd won. People say, you're crazy. What do you mean you knew you won? That was my sign from the universe. Well, I believe the universe sends us signs all of the time. But most people are on autopilot every single day. Yeah, they're not, your eyes are open, but they're not really open. You're just getting up, going through the motions, going to work, driving in traffic. There could be a billboard that God or the divine power up there has wrote something specifically to you to look at. And you could be staring at it and it could be telling you something. And you could just be taking that as if that's what it is. Or you could be taking that as a sign if you're looking for it. Um, results go where energy flows. Seek and you will find. It's done unto you as you believe. This stuff's all in the Bible, right? So um, so I knew that was my moment. I applied for the show. I heard back within a couple of weeks um, and um, I, I got on and went through the motions. 60,000 people applied and they whittled it down to 18. 18 get accepted. Um, and I was one of those guys. Unbelievable. That school dropout mm -hmm. to then winning Apprentice and... Alan Sugar buying half your business. Like, it's an unbelievable achievement. You should be Thank proud, you. man. Like, genuinely. Like, what was the steps and processes every week? Did you feel mm -hmm. stronger every week? Or yep. did sometimes like ADHD, like, you can, I'd imagine, doubt yourself mm -hmm. as well as we're positive and see the world mm -hmm. differently. Like, you feel as if maybe you're not doing enough. Did, mm -hmm. you, did you just get stronger or did, you, did the ADHD kick in as well? So um, between January and, and April the 26th is when you go away and you go on the show and you disappear for nine weeks. You disappear off the face of the earth, yeah? And my business at the time, I was like the epicenter. My phone rang a thousand times a day, yeah? And um, we had lots of contracts, all property management companies, reactive maintenance. It was a chaotic model to run anyway. And they say you can only tell four people. So I was like, well, what am I gonna do about my company and all these customers, these agents that keep ringing me all the time um, to send my guys out? and so on so um uh i had to go away for nine weeks so i made a big sacrifice and i'm gonna talk come back to that um but when you go when you go through the process you know a lot of people go there um to be on tv yeah they, they don't seriously believe they can win i went as a competitor i went to compete to win the show um to build a business I wasn't interested in the TV stuff. The TV stuff was fucking awesome post winning. Yeah, and while it was on, I loved it. It was the best time of my life. Um, but I went to build a business because I saw that as long term. If I can build finance in business, I can build a career and I can and I can build wealth, which is what I wanted to do. So um I really, I really believed, genuinely believed I could win. It was almost like, I say genuinely believed, like it was not even an option for me to lose. And I don't want people to think that's arrogance because it isn't. You go into any competition, you have got to go believing you can win, yeah? Hussein Bolt does not go into um, uh, the 100 meters thinking that he might come third. That guy's won before it's happened. Any competition that you ever enter into, you must back yourself people say but did you really think you could win did you really think that i'm like are you crazy of course i fucking did do you think that i waste my time entering competitions that i don't think i'm gonna win who enters to come third do you know what i'm saying who enters to come third or second i don't i go to win and i was able to pull it off um but maybe i could have lost i don't know but in my mind it wasn't even an option it was just not an option yeah um so each week you go through the tasks and I was way out of my comfort zone, way out of my comfort zone. You know, I was the plumber running a plumbing business. I didn't know about marketing properly. I didn't know about sales. I didn't know about pitching, presenting. You know, I'm quite rough around the edges. I wasn't like the other guys that had gone to great schools and had been in corporate careers and you know, it was, I was a kind of, I was the underdog, the wild card, you know, I am an underdog and, um, and I was the, I was the, the rogue, the one that shouldn't win. Right. So 
Um, so each week I, I went through it, but you're right. I got more confident each week because I realized that most people there were just there because um, they wanted to be on the show. There was only one or two serious contenders that were going to be that were going to have an opportunity to try and challenge me, and I identified those within 48 hours. So I did my thing. The the process was brutal. It's nothing like it looks on TV. 18 hours a day, six days a week, horrendous filming schedule um really difficult tasks the odds are stacked against you and these guys that were coming out of a job where they were working for banks or law firms you know they're used to finishing at four or five o'clock i was used to doing 18 hour days so they were dropping like flies off the back of this just the work ethic alone that we were having to do you know was um completely wiping them out so each week the numbers were just going down and down and down and down and i was getting closer and closer and all this this belief that I'd convinced myself that I was going to win was becoming more real every day. Every day I was getting one step closer. Um, yeah, one step closer. How do you feel when you get self, self-doubt? Because no matter how confident we be and how much we believe we were going to achieve in life, self-doubt always creeps in. How do you deal with that? Go, into the, go and stand in front of the mirror and tell myself I'm a fucking champion 10 times. Yeah. It's the only way. I've got to drill it back in. Have to drill it back in. Um, I said to my partner yesterday morning, I was like, I'm getting soft. I'm getting soft. You know, I, I could just, I feel myself getting soft. Um, I'm, I, I push sales very, very hard in my business. And um, the last couple of weeks, I've not, I've been distracted doing a few other things. And I just got, sometimes you got to remind yourself. You've got to remind yourself who you are, what you're capable of, what have you been through? You know, what have you, what have you been able to overcome? You can do anything. You could do anything that you set your mind to. What's stopping you? You know, and there's all these things out there um, that kind of push us down or suppress us and neg us out. You know, I'm, I'm trying to stay away from all negative. Anything that's negative is removed from my life. Anything that doesn't serve me to make me feel great, to make me feel like a champion, to make me feel like I can do it. I need people telling me that. I need to tell myself that. I need to be watching um, amazing content, great um, stories like you have on your podcast. You know, all of these guests with amazing stories, that's power. You know, using other people's journeys and how they've overcome really helps me, um, you know, and um, you just got to, you got to beat it out. As soon as it comes, it's like a cancer. If you leave that doubt to creep in and you don't beat it out very, very quickly, cut it out, do whatever you can to destroy it, it grows quickly, right? Yeah. So at 25, mm -hmm. like we've said before, you dropped out of school, you've read Sugar's book, mm -hmm. you believed you were going to win it straight away. You eventually win it. Like, it's as if your stars aligned. And people who don't believe in the law of attraction, people who don't believe in belief, and it's genuinely, like you say, it's, you can people can get confidence mixed up with arrogance. And, yep. And that's down to them. Who fucking cares? But it's all down to the individual what you want to achieve. So when you win that, your mum thinking you're going to be a failure at 15, maybe going down the same route as your old boy. Not your old mm. dad was a, a bad person, mm. but going down that addiction mm. avenue. And then winning that, like, how was that feeling, not just for you, but your mum? I had the, the best feeling um, that I could, I had the best moment, probably one of the best moments in my life other than my son being born. Um, when I came out on the You're Hired show, yeah, and um, the winning version of it, I'm, I'm walking out and they're cheering me, Jojo Valente, the winner. Come out, Jack D's like the presenter at the time. It's been Dara Brin and a few others over the years. He was there and um, I came out and my mum had obviously come down to the show and she was sat in the audience and she was down there on the right hand side and I looked over at her, tears in her eyes. I had an amazing suit on. I, I strode out of there like I was on top of cloud nine and I looked at her and she was crying. And I looked her in the eyes and I just was propelled 10 years back when I walked out of the headmaster's office and she was crying and I was like, I told you. I was like, no, it wasn't a told you so moment. It was a, um, I've made you proud again. I've made you proud again. And she looked at me like, fuck man, how has this kid done this? You know? And there was a moment, because when I, when I left, you go away for nine weeks, yeah? And I told all of the businesses and everybody around me that my auntie in Italy was ill and she lived on a goat farm in the mountains and there was no Wi-Fi. So I said, I've got to go away. It's an emer emergency. I don't know when I'm coming back. Yeah. And um, so 
uh, my mum dropped me off at the train station and I looked back at her and I was like, right, next time you see me, I'm going to be the winner. Take care. She's like, yep, son, you'll do well. You'll do well. I know she didn't believe I was going to win it. Just like when I told her I'd applied, she didn't think I was going to get on. Um, and I was like, no, no, mum, I'm telling you, the next time you see me, I'm going to be the winner. She was like, go on, Joe, go and do your best. Go and do your best. And... Um, and um, she messaged me about a year and a half after uh, after the show. And she said to me, just a random text came through. She's like, Joe, I'm just watching the rerun on the iPlayer. And she was like, who would have actually known that you could have won this? And then she messaged back saying, you did. Yeah, and then that was my moment where I knew that she knew that I wasn't just full of shit and I actually genuinely believed that it was going to happen. The law of attraction is, is the most um, powerful tool that we can use as humans. And when I first came across it, my business partner when I was 23 um, said to me, I said to him, Chris, listen, I keep um, vi having these powerful visions and shit just keeps coming true. I wanted to get an M3 convertible. I've got one. I wanted to do this business. I've got one. Loads of things happen. He's like, Joe, that sounds like the law of attraction. And I'm not even joking. I went onto YouTube, typed in the law of attraction. And then I came across Oprah Winfrey, Jim Carrey, Will Smith, Bob Proctor. They're all talking about this thing called the law of attraction. And it was almost like I'd stumbled across the secret. You know, it was a fucking secret. I'm like, hang on. On. why have I not been told about this? You're telling me this is a hack, the, a metaphysical law, a hack that you can hack the universe and you can attract what you want to become and there's a way that you can practice this shit and it comes real and it's not voodoo magic, right? And all these successful people are talking about it. So clearly it works because I remember going to some people close to me at the time and I was like, hey man, I fucking stumbled on something here. I'm onto something, right? And I showed them and they were like, what a load of bollocks. What is that bullshit? And I'm like, what do you mean? I was like, look at the people that are talking about it. This can't be bullshit. Yeah, they have used it. So that's when I decided to screw everybody. And I, I don't tell anybody anymore about anything that I'm doing that isn't going to give me a positive response. I don't want to ever hear can't, oh, no, nah, you shouldn't do that, blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm not interested in sharing my dreams um, with people um, that, you know, that can't share the same vision. Yeah, because they can dim your light. Without a doubt. Do you know what I mean? Like Jim Carrey, I think he wrote a check for $10 million, mm -hmm. put a date on it, put it in his wallet. <clears throat> And then five years later, he opened it up. And just before he'd opened it up, he'd got a check for $10 million for Dumb and Dumber. Yeah. Five years later. Yeah. But writing it down becomes more clearer. It's called spelling for a reason. Mm -hmm. But you're putting yeah. spells into the universe. If you write it down, it becomes 50% or 70% more clearer mm -hmm. in the mind and it's more likely to happen. Like, we're just so dumbed down by even radios and TV, and newspapers and politics and all the mm. bullshit of the day where it's just suppressing your mind and you can't think for yourself. Step back out that fucking mm. comfort zone. Step back out your life. Like, see the world a bit differently. Visualise what you want for that. Trade, tradesmen the now that's been working for somebody for 10, 20 years. Start your own business. Become your own boss and hire your own people. Listen, a lot of people are just happy and content mm. with their life and working for someone else. And that's fine. If you're happy, then so be it. Mm. But if you're driving that lorry or whatever you're doing, like you can own that business. You can get your own lorry. You can get your own work, your staff. Like anything is possible. Like you say that. Like, You've not just got a good energy, good suit, like you've got a good belief system, mm -hmm, which mm -hmm. is the core to it, then achieving anything you want in life. How much is Alan Sugar involved in, in the show? Is he just there for filming or is he more hands-on than people think? Turns up um, at the beginning when he tells you the task and then disappears and you go off for two or three days and go and deliver the task. You know, we were talking about alpha males on the train down here and this guy, honestly, I've never seen anything like it, right? He's a small guy, right? And just the aura and the presence that he has um, of this not to be fucked with. It was just incredible to watch. Um, and um, yeah so he's there and then he's there in the boardroom and um, so you don't get to see that much of him you know I used to hate it when I won a task because if you win a task you go in the boardroom you get to tell him a lot about the good highlights that you've done yeah 
and then off you go back to the house. Well, the guys that got to um, lose, they got to sit and battle it out in front of him for another three hours. I mean, the boardroom scene's like 20 minutes on the show, but on the, on the actual day, it's like four hours of just in the boardroom. So I actually wanted to lose. I wanted to be in front of him because I, didn't, I wanted to talk to the guy. I wanted him to know who the fuck I was. He wasn't going to learn who I was and know that I was his right business partner if I couldn't actually talk to him. So I quite enjoyed getting um, in, being on the losing team, um, believe it or not, because I was so confident that what the biggest mistake everybody makes on that show and maybe in life um, is that they're so focused on what everybody else is doing, yeah, um, and why that other person did something wrong, um, and they're nowhere focused on why what they're doing and what they've done right. So I chose to say, right, people pulling people back in the board and going, yeah, he did this or he did that. And it's like, well, what did you do? Um... And then with me, it was right. I'm going to focus on every task. I'm going to smash a minimum of one thing that's yeah, so better than everybody else that when he comes to me, I'm going to talk about me. I don't want to talk about why well, Dave has done a shit job. I want to talk about why I've done such a fucking good job. Do you know what I mean? So people are pulling other people down all the time, focused on everybody else. They're not focused on themselves. You know, we talk about all of the distractions that are happening in the world right now. How many people are on their phone every day scrolling through? looking at news, looking at the Kardashians, worrying about energy prices, getting involved in politics. You're spending, you know, 80% of your 24 hours a day giving your consciousness to something else that isn't you. Your, con you, your consciousness is being distracted. If you took back that 80% and just channeled it into why what you can do well, this is why people don't get the results they want because there's so many distractions. And the same with The Apprentice, they're focused on all the other people, what they're doing wrong, and not why they can do it right. Um, so, you know, um, I wanted to get back in the boardroom so I could spend more time with the guy, so I could get to know him. And um, I think I had a really good relationship with him. I think he quite liked me. I was very honest. I didn't bullshit once. If I fucked up, I said it. You know, and everybody again tries to mask why they screwed up or they don't own their they don't own their mistakes. They don't own their fuck ups. You know, people don't realize that owning your fuck ups in life is the biggest superpower that you can ever possess. Yeah, you failed at doing this. Yeah, I know. What a fucking amazing experience that was. They're like, what? They're trying to take the piss out of me for failing at something. I'm saying it was the best thing that ever happened to me. Automatically, you've removed their power. Just like a bully at school saying that you're a fat kid. Yeah, I know I'm a fat bastard, right? Automatically, you've killed their power. Yeah, so there's nothing that they can say anymore. So owning your weaknesses and utilizing them as your strengths is um, what I recommend that everybody does. So what happens when you win then? What is the perks and benefits? What do you get when you win the apprentice? 250 grand in a bank within a week. Tax -free. Um, not tax free, no. Bastards. <laughs> Straight into the bank, yeah. And um, also, they ch the, the cheeky bastards, they charge you back. I, they give you 250 grand and then you get his accounting team and his finance team and then they charge you for it. I couldn't believe it. I was being charged back by his business for PR services, for accounting services, for um, payroll services. I was like, what? You're taking two and a half grand a month back of the 250 you've given me. So within a year, you've already clawed 25 grand back. It was crazy. But look, it was the best thing ever. He chose me, didn't have to choose me, right? He changed my life and I'm forever in his debt, forever grateful, regardless of um, me splitting with him and everything else so he becomes my business partner you get to go and meet him after the show and then you get to see him once a month it was an hour once a month now it was great um we had a good team but they're all finance people you got an fd assistant fd accountant and um him and but mostly his team and all they helped me really to do was put a financial infrastructure in place in my business. It was a weird one, James, because the guy that won the year before me, Mark Wright, was in um, SEO, Google, pay-per-click, all business to business. And he worked and lived out of London. Fucking phenomenal. Using your Lord Sugar's name to, you know, get your business contacts. I worked in the consumer market selling boilers to Mrs. Smith. You know, so when you have Lord Sugar's name attached to it, yes, it helped us drive more sales, but it also didn't have the same weight. 
you know? So it was a service industry that I worked for, consumer, not business. So, you know, I probably, they didn't add as much value as I wanted. So after two and a half years, every time I kept going there, I was like, look, I want to be national. I want to do this. I want to do that. How can we grow? How can we go faster? You know, he, in his book, it said that he made all of his, his biggest wealth in the back end of his 20s. So I was like, I was obsessed with it. I was like, I've got to do that. You're with me. I'm now going to replicate what you've done. Yet every time I was going there, he's telling me to slow down. We're not doing this. We're not doing that. And it became actually quite negative for me. And um, his team were pissing me off because they were always trying to score points. It was bordering politics. It was really weird. You know, for, I'd never been in an environment like that. And I was just like, one day, I was just like, right, fuck this. I was like, look, I want to be a national business. You clearly don't want me to be, right? But I am not going to keep coming here and every week trying to tell you what the next move is and you telling me that I can't do it. If you're afraid of me failing, which there is a big chance that I probably will because I want to grow quickly, then I understand you don't want your reputation um, damaged by it. So let me buy you out and I'll go it alone. He looked back at me and said, look, no one's ever spoke to me like that before. Um, let me give you, I'll give, give me 48 hours and I'll come back to you. 48 hours, we agreed a deal and I was out. Two and a half years in, first apprentice to do it. You know, and I look back and I had about 40 people, 40, 30, 40 people working for me at the time. You know, and I was 27 and I was like, Jesus Christ, you know, it was a real ballsy moment for me because then it hit the papers, put apprentice winner splits with Lord Sugar, first person to have done it. Then like people are like, is everything okay? Is the business in a fin financially strong? Is it failing? Is that why you've split? And I was like, no, 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 it's none of that. These are the reasons. My team were great. They stuck with me and I think I bought them out when we were doing somewhere in the region of like 2 million a year. Then fast forward two years, we were doing a million a month. So a ballsy decision that obviously mm. paid off, but why did he not free the reins a bit for you to then do what you set out to do? Mm. Like obviously being as a kid, you've always flew mm. solo anyway. Yep. Everything you've achieved, you've done yourself. Like how was that choice in your mind? Like you say, you probably felt suffocated and when you feel like that, mm. you don't like it. So yeah. you just wanted to get the shackles off. But when you'd make that decision, like why did he not back you? Well, I think there's two things. He's very smart in business. So maybe he understood that there were big risks associated to growing at the pace that I wanted to. And to go to build a national company, you need a lot of finance to do it. And I don't think he was, and he probably thought that, you know, because he tells you at the beginning, straight down the line, put 250 grand and you're not getting any more. This guy is a very shrewd businessman. When he fucking says it, he is not breaking what he said. There's one thing that I came to learn. Yeah, so that was it. So he's like thinking, this guy wants to go national. I'm gonna have to get, you need a few million to get national you ain't gonna do it on 250 grand 250 grand at one point in time to me was like wow a quarter of a million it's nothing you know when you're building a multi-million pound business in the service industry it's been get eaten up like that in a second right um so so um i believe that he maybe saw the risks of failure and i knew it it's an obvious fast growing business is a risk and secondly i genuinely believe that he had a different motivator it became weird you know when you can see something for what it is and you understand something i saw that he didn't want me to go big he didn't want the headache he wanted me to be a good little boy that um did what he was told that came came to the board meeting every month and didn't argue no challenges no ag and and just plod along, make a couple hundred grand a year, report some all right numbers at the end of each year so it looked good on him, so he could do us on the show. And I'm like, fuck this. I'm not being paraded or hiding in the shadow here. I want to go for it. Um, so I don't believe his driver was the same as mine. And people are like, yeah, but wasn't he a billionaire tycoon? I'm like, yeah, but his drivers are completely different. His motivators are completely different. And whenever you're in a business partnership, you know, people get emotional about being in a partnership. I'm like, if you're in a business partnership, it serves you until a point in time. Then when that point in time is up, like it was for me, I was like, well, I've took the money. I've got the exposure. I've had the financial infrastructure. You're not really doing anything else for me other than holding me back and having half my business. So, you know, I'm pretty confident to make the decision. Now it's time to split. So it was the right time for us and, and we split. Yeah, you felt it was, I thought it was the right moment, especially mm. if he's a billionaire. In all honesty, they mm. probably didn't give a fuck about you. Obviously, he's Definitely. not wanted. <laughs> yeah. 250 grand's fuck all to him, but mm -hmm. he can make more doing whatever he's doing exactly. in the sideline. So to, when you're that status and being a billionaire, their time is precious. Mm. 
They don't want to be wasting time talking about 200 grand, 500 Arguing grand. Arguing with a 25-year-old yeah. that's cocky and, you know, thinks he knows it all. I did probably approach it wrong sometimes out there. I was, you know, I, I should have been better. I did have a know-it-all attitude and I do I wish. I didn't throw the opportunity away because I, I took it for what it was and I've done very, very well off the back of it. But I look now, like Lord Sugar, is a, he's a lord, you know. He's in a sir. He's in some very, very elite, prestigious clubs, you know. You know, the Order of the Garter, if you're a sir. I think there's only like 150 of them. This elite club to the queen. Like, I, I'm a big um, secret society guy. Um, I, I want to, you know, and, and these very prestigious circles. And now I know what I know. I'm like, shit, I did not take those opportunities. I should have been better. Um, but hey, it is what it is. So, Stephen, you have one now playing so many. Do you only get to see him once a month? Once a month, yeah. For how long? An hour. And that would have been a lifetime of one hours if you were still in business with Basically, him? Basically, yeah. How many people at the table? Five. A lot of people would pay 100 grand though, 200 grand. Yeah, oh, without a doubt. With him for yeah. a couple of hours, I'd imagine. Completely, yeah. And it would be nice to have it now. Now I'm in the business of business world. It'd be great to say Lord Sugar was my business partner still, but I can't say that anymore. I can say he was, you know, and... um it is, it is what it is, but... But do you think he would have respected that decision for you to just go, fuck it, I'm going to do it? I think so. I think I gave him a way to get... I think I gave him a good exit. He gave, I gave him a good exit. Do you think, obviously, he can't pull away because of the show? Yeah, I think so. He's not going to be out. He doesn't want to pull away. And then there was a trend after. About a year later, somebody else did it because no one had done it up until the point that I'd done it. Um, and so then they, everybody started to follow suit. I think he split from like three or four now of winners post me. Like the original ones, like Leah, Mark, Ricky, Tom Pellery. He's still with those guys. Um, for 10 years, 12 years. Yeah, years. he's still been with them a long time. Yeah. Fair fucking play as well for yeah. people sticking out. But everybody's thought process is different. Exactly. It doesn't go with your floor and fuck yeah. it off and change it, Without change the doubt. game. Do you know what I mean? Like, so when you then created the business to then making mm. turning over a million a month, like, what are you thinking then? That like you've set out to everything you've achieved. Then you won the apprentice. Mm -hmm. Like when you're doing that, you may talk about depression. When did mm. your depression seep in? Well, I mean, the, the winning the show was an anticlimax for sure. I mean, I had this buzz and it was like the highest high that I've ever had. And then all of a sudden, after you win and the press stops and everything else, you come crashing back down to earth and realize you just got to go and run a plumbing business. So from 25, I went on this mission to, to achieve, right? Not just in business, I needed to find big things that I could do that matched the size of the apprentice so that I had something to get up for. I love to push myself and compete so then i wrote this book and it was like my, my, my autobiography it's built from the classroom to billionaire boardroom got that as a number one best song on amazon it was cool i did it you know these were like they were good things that i wanted to do but they were cheap frills i was trying to match the buzz of winning this show right i then did a podcast that went to number one in the world um on apple social entrepreneur in 2017 and um, I did three episodes, got it to number one. It stayed there for 24 hours, got the screenshot and then quit the podcast. Yeah, and I'm like, right, that was it. Done that one now. Then I went to Forbes, Forbes 30 under 30. I got into that, 18,000 candidates in Europe. I was one of the 30 that was appointed into that, did that. Then I kept applying for all these entrepreneur awards, anything I could do to just try and feel that um, champion status again. And I don't really think I've found anything yet. Nothing has matched that. Um, and I, I'm trying to look for something now that I can do. What can I actually do now that is as big as an achievement as that, that's got much attention and is as well respected and it just comes with all of the things that came with it. I, I'm struggling to find it. And... Um, I just went on this mission and then I really pushed Impra. You know, I got, I exited from him. I'm like, right, fuck you. Watch what I'm going to do now. Watch how big I'm going to take this business. But I always dreamed, James, to make that a national company. From 22 when I started, I had visions of making it a national. And I was going to get it national if it killed me. Yeah, I was going to go national if it killed me. And that clouded my judgment. Yeah, because I was so obsessed with building a national company, it clouded my judgment. So I hit 29, we're doing a million a month. We won national installer of the year. And um, September 2019, I knew that we were financially in trouble. We'd got, I'd literally put everything on the line to get to um, this big business. It was a monstrous organization. It was huge. We had to do like 60,000 in sales a day, new sales a day, just to break even. It was like some serious, serious pressure. Um, and um, we'd expanded very quickly. 
And I was overexposed. I was operating in every major city in the UK. And then we had a really warm winter. We had Brexit happen. People stopped buying boilers to the same level. And so the business really struggled. Sales really decreased. Cash flow took a massive hit. Then I was like, shit, you know, this could go down. Yeah, this I'm going to lose this, right? And um, it was probably the hardest time of my life the hardest because I was really worried about what was going to happen because if I lost the company you know I'd gone national I'd I'd shown this amazing picture of success all all up until this point up until 29 everything I fucking touched turned to gold yeah everything I said I was going to do I achieved and I'm sure everybody watching was like how is this kid doing this how is he how is he doing this yeah and what I didn't realize at that time, that what goes up must come down, right? And, um, you know, uh, I'd got, um, I'd, uh, Alfie Best, you've had him on, yeah, right? Alfie, yeah. And um, he's a mentor of mine and, um, and he speaks at some of my events and he says, you know, don't believe your own hype. And I believed my own hype. Yeah, and I thought that I could just do anything. I, did, I didn't even know what failure was at that point. It was, didn't even know it existed, right? So... We won National Install of the Year in 2019, September. And then um, by December, we were in bad trouble. And I was like, fuck, man, I'm going to lose this business. I'm going gonna to go into the press. I'm going to be the first apprentice to have failed. It was horrible. It was horrible what I was going through. I was worried about my staff. I was worried about everything. Um, we, I was worried about the people that we owed money to. There was so much pressure, right? Um, and then I was like, well, this business is going to go down. I can put it into liquidation and just walk away from it because um, we were running out of cash. I didn't have enough time to find investment to prop it up. The sales had dropped so substantially, it hit us like out of nowhere. There's the, th the thing that you can't control in business is the market. When markets change, doesn't matter um, how good your business is. If the demand stops for the product, unless you've got multiple products and multiple demands or recurring revenue and everything else, and our business was just way too young to have all of that in place. We'd done it on pure, hardcore sales growth, right? That just kept going and going and going. And so when the sales stopped, we were in trouble. And so I had to... Um, find someone to buy the business. I found a recovery specialist to buy the business and um, I wasn't going to get a lot for it. And the deal that we had to structure wasn't great. It meant that I had to um, voluntarily liquidate part of the business, which meant I shut it down with debt um, and I had to sell part of the business. I sold the brand, I sold the assets, I sold all of the contracts. So all of the people that had service contracts with us, maintenance contracts with us, the new company took all of that on. So the customers were going to be looked after. That was a big priority in mind. The number one priority of mine was that all of my staff kept their jobs and the new co that bought my business said that all of the staff were going to keep their jobs which was amazing it was around Christmas it would have been terrible news if I'd have told them that they were losing their jobs at that point and um and um, also that there was going to be this new company that the suppliers that were going to lose money were able to trade with, right? Um, and recoup some of those lost profits back. And so that's what happened. And then January the 10th, I um, sold and exited part of the business. I shut down part of the business. Um, and then all of a sudden I was out. But it was a very weird scenario because it was almost like I've sold part of it and all my staff have kept their jobs and everything else and this new company is going to go on and trade. But there's this debt associated to it that's going to come back to hit me. Um, it wasn't my personal debt, limited company debt that's going to come back on me. Um, and I'm not really going to walk away with any of the millions that I expected to. I expected to walk away with 50 million. I thought, build this company and it's going to be national. Someone's going to buy it. And by the time I'm 30, I'm going to be a multi, multi, multi millionaire and say, for life because I was planning to exit um, and um, it didn't happen and it was like all of a sudden I came crashing back down to earth at the fastest I, I never felt anything like it the knocked off my pedestal I, I believe that I'd got too confident too complacent too cocky and the universe right hooked me um, and um, put me back down and said right you need to go and learn a lesson and I think it was all taken away from me on purpose because um, I think I'd got too comfortable maybe I don't know and um <clears throat> yeah so um the short term I got press release out sold the business was great and everything else then um uh then uh, another article came out that found out that we shut the business down with two million quid's worth of debt, basically. So we'd closed it off with two million quid's worth of debt. Of course the papers picked it up. Apprentice winner goes bust. Yeah, I'm fucking 
front page of the Sun. Then it was um, uh, uh, well, I don't know if it went front page, but headline on whatever it was online or whatever, right? Um, and then it was on the Sun. Then it was on the Daily Mail. Then it was on everything else. Oh, I thought, oh my God! I remember when it hit the press. It was like the worst feeling ever. But January when I exited, you know, and I want the, I want my story to inspire people to believe that they can get back up, that you can come back. Yeah. Going to rock bottom is, I actually think that going to rock bottom is good as long as you don't stay there. Sometimes we need to go there to reevaluate um, what it is that we really want and what our purpose here is on this planet and where it is that we're trying to get to. So I don't mind going to rock bottom um, if I deserve to go there, but damn, you can't stay there. Um, and, I, and, and January the 10th, you know, I'd had this big empire. Then all of a sudden it was gone. And I was like, fuck, shit, what am I going to do now? I, I, I went into very bad depression, didn't leave my apartment for like four weeks. I was just locked in, couldn't get up, really demotivated. You know, I was thinking I was a terrible failure. It was just horrible. Um, I felt sorry for myself. Um, it was just like, how, why do I deserve this? I've worked so hard for 10 years. Like this shouldn't have how, this isn't how it should have been. You know, and all of these, all of these emotions and everything else. And um, I remember one day I was like, fuck, you've got to snap out of this. You've got to snap out of this. Like there were read, this isn't just your fault. This wasn't just your fault that this happened. The market changed. You're not a bad businessman. You can redo it. Then I read an article on Forbes about this woman who built this company, lost everything, and then was able to get back up. Then I started searching for articles of failure and there wasn't actually that many, but the big guys, the Bransons, the Sugars, the Peter Joneses, they all got rich very early in their twenties. Like I was able to lost it all. And then very quickly came back. So I was like, fuck it, man, I can do this. And then all of a sudden, I just woke up one day and went on to Twitter. And now this is where Lord Sugar came to save me again. And I don't know whether he knows that he did it, right? But he came to save me again indirectly. So he put a tweet out tweeting one of the articles saying um, of the one that said Joseph Valente apprentice when it goes past. He retweeted it and wrote, you can't win them all. And now this fella, because at the time I'd gone into, I'd like very quickly then said, right, I'm going to train businesses now on how to scale. I've learned through failure and success. I'm going to teach businesses. And he's like, now this fella thinks he can teach businesses um, how to grow. And it was like the most muggy um, statement that he could have put, you know, just kicking me when I was down. And I looked at it and I was like, right, it just it filled me with fire. It filled me with fire. I shot out of bed and I was like, fucking right. I literally cannot have this. Watch what I'm going to go and do now. Watch what I'm going to go and do now. So it's like the greatest motivation. This guy that I idolized for so long was now mocking me that I'd lost everything at 30 and my business had gone down and kicked me when I was down. But he actually kicked me up the ass and I got back up. Um, do you think that's maybe why you done it though? Because you knew your person maybe even though you think it was mocking maybe it was mm. a case of it ain't fucking over but he knew who, who you were as yeah. a person that it could have been or do you just think he was just being a muggy bastard I hope so that he did it for the right reason why would you do that somebody loses a business like mm. he's been there he's probably mm. lost businesses mm. like Alfie Best Senior, he was a multi millionaire. Yep. Lost it all sleeping in his van again but that moment changed his life to then yep. he's now a billionaire like, mm. like how hard is that then for you to think you could have been still working with him. Do you think that was a case of that's what happens when you leave me? Or? I think it was a fuck you. Yeah, do you yeah, think so? I, I, I don't think it was a nice thing. You watch his tweets and the way that he approaches stuff. It definitely wasn't a nice thing. He never reached out to me and said, Joe, man, look, I um, hope you're all right or whatever. Like, he wasn't that type of man. It wasn't, don't worry, son, you can get back up and do it again. Like you would expect a mentor of that status to do. But look, whatever it was, it fucking helped me. And um, it was the best motivation you can ask for. When someone tells you, you can't, it can't be done and you've got a character like mine, I don't want it's going to be okay. Don't fucking tell me it's going to be okay. Tell me I'm a fucking, I'm weak, I'm pathetic and I'm a loser. And then I'll go and prove to you why I'm the baddest man on the fucking planet. That's how I see it. You know, I don't want to be, I don't want to be cuddled. And so he did me a massive, massive favor. And then I got 
back up and I was like, right, watch what I'm going to do next. And so I decided to use my my um, experience. I think the greatest entrepreneurs are the ones out there that solve real life problems. Yeah. And I realized that, you know, you used to ask me very early on, how does a guy start and then become a CEO of a national business in seven years that was expelled from school with very little education and um, no business experience? Well, I was a plumber that started a plumbing business. Yeah, I was not a businessman. I was a tradesman, good at the job, terrible about running a business. But I'd spent thousands of hours across that journey um, investing in myself, personal development, training courses, reading books, learning sales, learning management, learning finance, you know, getting around mentors, surrounding myself with the right people. I invested huge amounts of time in myself. So I was leveling up myself at the same pace that my business was growing. Most businesses go pop because the business owner's in the way and they can't control it. It outgrows them. They don't know what to do. Yeah. So most business owners are in their own way. And um, I realized that I was pretty good at leveling up and somehow I'd got to this national level, but a national, it was probably beyond me at that point. And my, um, it was too big for me, you know, to be able to control. And then I said, well, I failed um, dramatically, yeah? And um, I've had an insane level of success. So surely this is valuable to people. The people that are the plumber that's doing 500 grand a year, 250 grand a year, and wants to learn how to do a million or two million, if he buys my blueprint, gets mentored by me, gets coached by me, I'm gonna be able to fast track his success and also tell him what to avoid. I had a mentor that lost a 50 million pound car business by the time he was 31, uh, mentoring me at the back end when Impro was going down. And that guy was the greatest um, um, support that I could ever ask for because he knew what to do to protect yourself when a business goes down. You know, th th you've got to be very careful in business that you're not putting personal assets and wealth and everything on the line, that you're doing everything by the book. You know, you don't get expelled as a director, so you can't continue to carry on your career and all these other things. So he told me what to do. Now, if I just had a success mentor, a guy that... <coughs> continued to achieve all the time, then the reality is he wouldn't have been able to help me in that scenario. Adam had, so he protected me and he made me feel better about the whole thing. And so I see that people, educating people around failure is probably better than success. And you need people that have been through failure. The best mentors have seen both success and they've seen both failure and they can evaluate the two and recommend um, the best of the back. So I started, I, I started after a couple of weeks right? Um, I got a new apartment. I broke up my missus. My missus left me. You know, I broke up my missus. I moved back to Peterborough, got an apartment and um, I took two staff with me from Impra. Uh, I took my PA and I took a social media um, apprentice with me because I was like, right, I'm going to start hitting social. I've got my PA to help me organize stuff. She's quite good at doing everything. And, um, and um, so we started this company called The Trade Mastermind, the secret to scaling your construction business. Well, I started doing lives on my phone. This is as simple as I built this business. Started doing lives on my phone with a whiteboard, talking to people about growing their business. The amount of plumbers that were watching it we're all over it. I started charging a thousand pound an hour to teach them how to build a plumbing business. Yeah. So within three weeks, I'd gone from um, having a fuckload of money. My company was paying for everything for me. I was taking big salaries from it, but I hadn't really built any personal wealth up until that point because I was putting it all into the business. I didn't think this business was going to go right. So I didn't leave with huge um, um, assets and I didn't leave with huge sums of money in the bank. But within three weeks of that, company going down, me exiting and walking away. I was making 20 grand a month in coaching fees for 20 hours work. So I'd literally within weeks got back into the game very, very quickly. I then launched an events business, um, which we started in March of 2020. Lockdown hit, wiped it out, stopped it immediately. And then I flipped online, started doing webinars from my apartment, selling an online course that taught plumbing companies, construction businesses, how to sell in the customer's home. Because they just go around and give quotes or prices and scrappy bits of paper. And my business was phenomenal at sales at Impra. We had the best, most professional workforce on the planet. It was incredible what we were able to do with sales because I'd built this formula by doing thousands of in-home sales appointments myself. And um, I knew this was worth money. So I was doing these webinars. I was making 25,000 pound an hour from my apartment, right, in the middle of 
lockdown once a week. I was pulling a hundred grand a month profit, right? Only three months after losing my fucking business. So I'd like turn this thing around. I couldn't believe what was happening. There was all these construction businesses that were worried about lockdown, that wanted to have a competitive advantage. And here I am with a huge brand in construction, well known, built the largest independent boiling station company in the UK and I'm selling my knowledge and they're eating it up. The good thing is though, we have got we they started to get really good results then um lockdown opened up we launched masterminds we've launched so many um online training courses our trade accelerator university and fast forward to now two and a half years on been able to do five million um in those two years um i've been able to create 25 jobs um i've got two and a half thousand clients um i've launched a um recruitment business i've launched a website business i've got a separate coach coaching business. I've got trade mastermind and we're just about to expand um, our blueprints and um, our strategies and our techniques into all business. So, you know, two and a half years on, I'm back in the game. I'm wealthy again. My life's fantastic. Um, I've learned incredible lessons. I've got an amazing business. I've got an amazing team, got great offices and, um, you know, I'm back. Do you think that decision with Sugar, do you then think that he knew what he was talking about? Mm -hmm. Once you did eventually mm -hmm. lose it, obviously you went solo and you've learned so much from it. No mm -hmm. money can ever replace how much mm -hmm. knowledge you've learned from yeah. failure as where your growth is. But do you think he seen what could have happened mm -hmm. when he what? told you to slow it down? Yeah. Oh yeah, definitely. Definitely. It was kind of growing quickly in business is um, risky. It really is. It's a massive risk, you know, and everybody that came on the journey with me, you know, and this is a really important lesson because when you go down in business and especially if you go down owing people suppliers money or whatever it may be, they, they, people come to the CEO with the pitchforks. Yeah. The pitchforks and the burning torches, they're coming after you. Right. And so I had a lot of people that wanted my blood. They wanted my blood. They wanted to see me, um, you know, nailed on the cross, it felt like. You know, I was the worst person on the planet, like I'd done it on purpose. Now, it's not it was like I was a crook and I'd robbed them, right? The market had changed, things didn't work, sales stopped, and it broke apart. It wasn't like, you know, I'd done anything untoward. And... Um, but they still wanted my blood. And, you know, I remember um, whenever a business goes down, and this is education for everybody, it's just important that I tell the story, right? Whenever a business goes down, you have to do a creditors meeting. So I had like 50 businesses come and I had to sit at the front on a table by myself, right, with this liquidator sat here and 50 people in the audience effectively wanting to see me, you know, a shot, and, um, you know, their temp and right. So they've lost money. They're emotional. Temperatures are fucking, uh, 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 tempers are high. And I just said to it and everybody was shouting at me and this and that and the other. And, you know, people were venting and I was just like, listen, I told each and every one of you, okay, that we were going to grow fast. Yeah. And if you come and do business with me, it's going to be a risk. We are going quickly and we're going to be national. Now, each and every one of you understood the risk. If you didn't, that means that you um, need to take responsibility because it means you're uneducated in business to be able to have leveraged as much credit as you did if you couldn't afford to lose it. You knew that we were on a journey for growth. You knew it was going to be a risk and when things were going great I was your best friend okay and I couldn't do anything wrong now that it's gone down it's all my fault you know so I'm um, just remember that everybody played a part in this and that this is a risk when you back a fast growing business and it pretty much silenced the audience and um and it pretty much silenced them all because I was like, I'm not being um, told that, you know, uh, that this is all me. And they knew the consequences of back in a fast growing business and back in a fast growing business, it's major risk. You know, it really, really is. And, and that's just business. But people get very, very emotional about business. Business is um, not personal. Business is business. Now, you know, losing money in business is horrendous. And I would never want anybody to lose money. And I'm really sorry for all of those people people that lost money but they also understood that there was a there was a potential that that could happen so you know you've got to own it as a business and if you're a business trading with a fast growing business be careful um and um if you're a business that is fast growing you know you've got to make sure that you've got cash businesses that make a loss businesses that make a profit can stay in business businesses that run out of cash it's game over 
for anybody that's watching now that's starting off a business and wants to take it mm. to the extreme levels, like, what advice would you give for them now with the knowledge that you know? Build a team. Build a team first. What usually happens is a business owner starts, gets it to a level, then starts to bring people in. Yeah, as he goes, when the business can afford to do that. And what that means is, it's like you're trying to underpin the growth every time you get there. You could pick the wrong people, they could have the wrong skills. And so I was saying this to my business partner the other day, like, you know, we're trying to build a billion dollar empire by the time we're 40, so we've got eight years to do it, right? And um, I'm like, if you look at somebody like in Silicon Valley, they go and get fi funding, right? But they go and hire the team first, yeah? And that's all well and good if you've got funding. If you're starting from scratch, it's difficult because you haven't got the money to fund it. But if you're starting with equity investment or investment, you can go and get the team first. So before they've even sold a product, invented a product or made a sale, right? They've already got the CEO. They've already got the chief marketing officer. They've already got um, the head of sales. They've already got product development, finance, and so on. So they've got the right team giving them the best chance to succeed you need to bring in people that um can help you on the journey you know it's knowledge and expertise is what it's all about knowledge and expertise and if you can't amass a team surround yourself with a mentor you know we we it's been a funny experience training um educating because we are the first the reason it trade master has done so well yeah in such a short period of time it's done phenomenal right it, i've pioneered the training training space in construction. There's no one doing it. I was the first in the space. I'm still pretty much the only one in the space. And, um, and, um, and, and that's why it's been so successful because people um, know that they are only going to go as far as their knowledge can take them. Yeah. But investing in training or knowledge or a mentor to try and help to guarantee your success is what I recommend every business owner should do. But so many businesses that I speak to are like, yeah, but you know, I'm only, if I'm only like a year or two in, probably I'll come back and get a mentor when I've done like three or four years. I'm like, that could be three or four years of fucking up. Get the mentor now. Yeah, no, Mike Tyson didn't start his boxing career training himself for five years, did he? And then go and get a coach. You get a coach from day one. So a business is no different. You need a business coach straight away because they're able to give you the roadmap of how you're going to get there. They're able to um, be that um, voice of opinion that sometimes you may not want to hear, shoulder to cry on, um, somebody to celebrate the success with. And, um, you know, that's what you need to do. You need to invest. Yeah. So somebody who's had the money, being mm -hmm. a multi-millionaire, lost it, had it mm -hmm. back. Now you want to be a billion dollar company. Like, mm -hmm. When is enough enough? Is it just the chase? Is it adrenaline rush for you? Like, what is it then? What does it all come down to? Because money is an illusion mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. Obviously we need it to survive and get things, but there's people out there who are happier than mm. me and you put together mm. that have fuck all. Like, yeah. Where, when is enough is enough? I'm not, I don't want to be a billionaire for the money. Believe it or not, I want to be a billionaire for the status. It's an achievement. It's something that I can measure that only a very few people have done on the planet. So for me, it's like if I get to a billionaire, right, I can, I'll, I'll have achieved something great. And look, I get my kicks from helping people. Yeah, I love personal development and training because I love to see people win. You know, I'm a positive guy and I thrive off other people's success. Like, you know, I, all I want to do is see other people win. Each one, teach one, reach back, pull somebody else up. Yeah, knowledge gains is knowledge shared. You know, and, and when you've come from a place that I have, you know, you, you want everybody to go up. I'm forever trying to bring my family, my friends, everyone I meet. I'm like, we're all going up. You know, I'm trying to drag everybody up all the time. But, you know, my best, um, my best time is when I give my mum money. I give my, you know, I put my mum into retirement when I was 28 years of age. Proudest moment of my life, right? I was able to quit a job. I gave her a load of cash. And then I gave her weight, a salary and money each month and still do. And um, it's been amazing. She's got to spend all of the time with the grandkids, my sister's kids and everything else. It's been incredible. Um, I have my son and my partner and, um, and people around me. I love to give my money to them. I want to give my money 
money to other people. I want to help other people. You know, I said to you, I'm going to go pick up a Lambo, right? That's a cheap thrill for me. It's a cheap thrill. Yeah, it's cool, but it's just a cheap thrill. I'll get bored of it in a second. But what I don't get bored of is knowing that the money that I have created can change somebody else's life. Me knowing that my mum got to sit at home while I worked 14 hour days and she got to spend time with my grandkids gives you the greatest feeling ever to keep going, right? Not, oh, I can go and buy this at the end of the month because I've got the money. I don't really care about that stuff for me. Yeah. And if you get a billion pounds, yeah, or a a hundred billion pounds, you can help a billion people. If I've only got a million, I can only help a few people, right? Yeah, a lot of people's businesses have failed, especially with lockdown, mm -hmm. Brexit. Um, I know a lot of businesses are, even when I walk along the streets in Glasgow, there's a lot of closed down shops. And what advice would you have for somebody who's lost their business and think there's no way out of the field? You can, you can, you can get back up. Yeah, you can get back up. Remember, money's in abundance. Money is in abundance. And um, it's not difficult to get it if you add value to the marketplace. So you have to dust yourself off. You've got to stop feeling sorry for yourself. You need to seek out because loads of businesses will have failed, but it's not their fault. COVID has wiped out so many. And the other thing that I come to realize, James, was I was like, well, if I had, once I'd um, left Impro, I was like, maybe it was I grew too quickly. And then all of a sudden COVID happened within like a couple of months. And then I was like, wow, there is businesses that are like, let's say you've got, I don't know, a family run butchers or whatever, right? And you've been doing it for 20 years and you've played it safe and you've made a good living and you've kept a good brand and everything else. Then all of a sudden, something comes along and wipes you out. And your whole ethos over those 20 years was I'm gonna go steady and safe. And then something way out of your control comes and wipes you out anyway. So it, it immediately made me think, you've got to go for it. Yeah, you've got to go for it because there's so many things outside of our control um, that are going to come and wipe us out. Then there is no point in going slow. There is no point in playing it safe. Use your experience as a business owner and the failures that you've been through and package it and sell it. There are so many people out there now that are willing to pay alternative forms of education. You know, we launched a podcast um, training business recently, yeah? And we're charging 15,000 pounds to teach our construction business clients how to launch a podcast, right? People are willing to pay for the knowledge, you know? Um, they're willing to pay for the knowledge. They want alternative forms of education. What can, what can you teach that is going to, you know, you've got a small... Um, selection of shops. How can you how can you take that and give somebody else that's a independent news agent the the blueprint or the model to scale or you know whatever it can be a gyms or you know whatever you got to you got to shake your experiences and package it into education and sell it as a yeah. product. Plans for the future, Joseph. Plans for the future are um, become the best version of me, live my potential, keep pushing, keep raising the bar, keep raising the bar. You know, I've spent the last two years coming back from the ground up. I'm in a strong position now, good finances again, big team underneath me. So I just, I'm, I'm going on a mission now to start really tackling, um, you know, the big things out there. I want to go and achieve some shit. I want my name to be in lights again. And I want to, um, you know, I want to do the, I want to do the undoable. For anybody that's watching, you've battled with depression yourself. Like I've said, you've been a multi-millionaire, you've lost it, you've clawed it back. Like, for anybody that's in this struggle right now, what advice would you have for them? You can get back up, but you've got to get back up. Stop blaming, own it. Um, it's water under the bridge, go again. You've got to go again. For anybody that's wanting to maybe get in contact with you, what's your social media platforms? At Mr. Joseph Valente. TikTok, Instagram. Would you like to finish up on anything, brother? Um, I'd just like to say thank you very much for having me on um, I really hope the audience enjoy the podcast please use my story as a shining example of that you can get back up you know that's what I want to inspire people to do and remember it's not going to come to you don't wait for opportunity create it for coming on today bro I'm telling your story Cheers, I've man. enjoyed it you've thank you so much I wish you all the best for your future mate keep hustling you too God bless